Hello everyone, this is Joni, and uh, I'm just coming back to you to uh, tell you all uh, I'm really sorry about what happened with the back of my video. I made uh, one video, but um, the story that I was telling took longer than an hour to tell. And um, it goes into a lot of detail about a lot of different things that uh, happened. And uh, so uh, I had to break it in two. And so when I started breaking it in two, I couldn't end it. I didn't know how to end the uh, uh, movie itself. So there, this is the second part to the video. And if you uh, want to finish watching it, because it gets into a lot of more details that uh, I've had um, in my lifetime. And there is one particular part. It's the very back part if you want to just, well, it takes it all to really understand what happened and everything. But um, if you want to watch it and get the uh, full impact of the ending of it and find out what happened, uh, go ahead and watch this video. I think that uh, it might make a difference in your life. I hope it does. And I hope that um, a lot of the people that hear it, that's why I made it, because like I, I may have told you, that I tried to make it for about three weeks and I couldn't do it because my blood pressure would go up so high I couldn't do it. And finally I thought, I don't care what happens to the blood pressure. It's going up because I think God wants it to go up. So, I think he wants you to see it as well. So, if you don't mind, please watch it. And I'll, I'll talk with you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to walk back up. She walked like that from my house to Jean's house. My house to Jean's house. Probably about 30 times. And I was getting so worried about her. I said... Mommy, I said, please come in and sit down and drink a glass of iced tea and let me fix you a sandwich. I said, you're hungry and you haven't had anything to drink. I said, you need something cool to drink. And uh, she said, well, she said, I can't right now. She said, I might later. But she just continued walking back and forth. And then she came down and I said, Mommy, I said, now I'm going to have to insist on you coming in and sitting down and let me fix you something to eat. And she said, uh, well, she said, I guess I could drink some a glass of water. I said, well, I'll fix you a glass of tea. So she came in, I took her in the dining room and set her down in there and, and uh, she was sitting over in front of the uh, glass doors that went out back. And um, she looked at me and evidently for a split second or for a few minutes of time she realized where she was and she started just crying so hard and she said I don't mean to be a burden for my children she said I wouldn't burden my children for anything she said I'm sorry if I'm causing you trouble and I said, Mommy, you're not causing me any trouble. I said, I had the tea fixed and I had the sandwiches fixed. I said, it bothers me more you out there in that heat walking so much. I'm afraid you'll have a heat stroke. So she decided she would stay in because she was in her right mind for just a little bit. But then it started getting worse again. And then she got to where... She thought that I was some woman that was just trying to keep her in my house and uh, not let her go. And um, uh, she kept uh, trying to take things down and move them from place to place and um, everything. And uh, it wasn't working out at Jean's house either because she was doing the same thing there. And at my sister Pat's house, she was doing things down there that... Uh, well, we just couldn't keep up with it. And um, we were afraid that she was really going to uh, just get up some night and walk out the door and not let us even know that she had left. And I knew she couldn't do that with me, but she wasn't like that with the rest of the other two because they had her in her own bed when she was at their house. And I was afraid that she would get up and just walk out and 
they would never know where she went. And uh, if she would get out, she would never have known how to get back. So um, we had a meeting. And uh, we decided that we were going to have to um, put her in a nursing home because that's all that we could do. There, we had tried... We, we had tried like that for about six or seven months. And, um, like I said, it was getting worse all the time. And all she did was sit and cry and want her mommy. And uh, she'd say, I want my mommy. I've got to get home before dark because my mommy is expecting me before dark. And that would just break your heart because you knew that... There was nothing like that going on, but in her mind, it was so tortured. And uh, so um, we said, well, she's going to have to be put in a nursing home. And they said, well, Joan, you're going to have to do it. And I said, I figured that. So it was left up to me to uh, sign her in the nursing home. So my sister went with me. My brother was working. And my sister went with me and we went down and took her to a nursing home. She didn't know where she was. It was a really nice, very nice nursing home with big shady trees all around it and, and uh, everything. And she was strong. She was so strong. She was stronger then than I am right now. And if it had not been for that Alzheimer's, she probably would have lived to been 110. I'm serious. Because she was in her late 80s then. And um, so we took her down and I went in. And before we left, I had to pack her clothes. So I got her suitcase and she hated that suitcase. She didn't like that suitcase because she said when she came to see the children, she had to bring that suitcase, and she thought the children would say, here comes this woman with this suitcase, and we didn't think that. It was just where she was so used to being so independent that it was hard for her. It was very hard. And um, so anyway, Dad... Um, I signed the papers, and I thought, oh my goodness, why am I the one that has to do this? But anyway, I went ahead and signed them because uh, I knew that um, she could have around-the-clock supervision, and we could see her all the time. And I knew before I signed her in there, I thought, you will never make it unless you have something that will totally occupy your mind. So I had always wanted to go to college, but uh, I didn't because I didn't feel that uh, I had a right to go to school until I got my kids uh, up to where they were big enough to where they could go on. And at that time, my daughter was in the 11th grade, and uh, she was already, um, she had all of her credits for the following year except for her English. And she had asked if she could go ahead and sign up for classes in college in her afternoon cl uh, because she had to go to school for that one credit. And I said, that's just a bunch of nonsense. I said, if you're going to have to be at school for uh, just one credit, go ahead and let's have them to okay it and tell them it's okay with me and start sign up for uh, a class at um, the college. So that's what she did, and she was the first student in West Virginia to attend college while she was still in uh, high school. And um, so she signed up for that. And I went, and I had already, I had not had any college classes except one. I had taken a psychology class. So I went down, and I looked at the catalog, and I thought, I have to have a class that will continue keep my mind so busy that I can't have time to think, but yet I can take my work and do it at the nursing home while I'm with Mommy. 
So I sign up for a class in um, English, and I have to do a research paper. And the one research paper, you have to read so many books uh, and do so much research, library research, and things like that, that uh, it takes the um, full term uh, class for that, for that one research paper. And my research paper was 45 pages long. And I did it on Williamsburg, Virginia. And um, I always loved that place. And um, I loved about the history of it and everything. And um, what all they had done there and Blackbeard and all that. Well, that's what I did. And I signed up and uh, started taking my classes. And I put her in the, and we took her up and put her in the bed. And um, uh, we introduced her to the uh, two ladies that were in her room. And um, some of the ladies down the hall, and then there were some men on that floor. And um, when I came back, the uh, nurse told me, she said, uh, Honey, she said, your mother would be a delight if it wasn't so funny. She said she is trying to help us dust all of the rooms and trying to fold clothes. Any clothes she sees, she's trying to fold them. And I told her, I said, that's the way Mama is. I said, uh, she loves to work. And she said, well, we can tell that. And when I was packing her clothes, I packed everything that she would need, her gowns and her underwear and... and um, Things are glasses, uh, and and I t definitely took her purse because, like I said, she could go nowhere without a purse. And in her purse, I put nothing, not a thing, because uh, I didn't think that she would even notice. Uh, because. Uh, she didn't, uh, but this time, because like I said, she, all she did was cry for her mommy. And um, so I just gave her her purse so that she could carry it. And, um, but there was nothing in it. And uh, so I took that back there and I put her purse in her uh, gym locker thing. No, it was in her nightstand. And I put her suitcase in her locker. And uh, so then I uh, went on and stayed with her until late that evening. Um, and then I went on home because uh, my husband was home when the kids were home. It was probably about 8 o'clock or 9. And uh, so then I had my next day, I started classes. So I went down to take my class. And I would take the class and then come back to Mom's. And I would sit there beside her and do all of my homework. And I had uh, 45 books that I read, and they were about this thick on Williamsburg. And um, I was having to take notes and everything, like most of you know, and um, on the note cards. And uh, so she kept getting worse and worse and worse, and it wasn't long until they had to start feeding her through the tube. And that did away with her getting up and moving around or anything. And uh, so uh, I didn't, the only time I worked when I came there was if she was asleep or if they she was totally knocked out with medication. Then I would go ahead and work just to keep my brain, to keep it off of that because um, I would have had a nervous breakdown if I hadn't. I'm just, I'm just telling you the plain truth about it. I, I couldn't have held up to it. And uh, so I had one sister. Um, it kept getting really worse and worse. And they, when they put the tube down her throat, uh, the poor thing looked so, so horrible, horrible. And But before they put the tube down her throat, um, her hair was getting real long. And she had never worn long hair. Her hair had always been about the length of mine right now. And um, I looked at the nurse 
that day when I was down there, and I said, uh, when she gets, when you get her up to take her to the bathroom again, I said, uh, or to put her on her bedpan, that's when she, what she was on. I said, while she is sitting there, if you all don't mind, I said, I'm going to cut her hair. And uh, she said, that would be fine with us. She said, uh, she'll be okay. I said, okay. I said, I'll bring the scissors and everything, and I'll cut her hair. She didn't know anything. She didn't know who I was. She hadn't known who I was for probably three, four, five months. And she didn't know who any of the children were. And um, her sister came down to visit her. She didn't know who she was. And uh, so um, I cut her hair, her sitting on the potty chair. And um, I thought, well, she looks better. And if anything happens now, she's going to look better. She's going to look like Mommy. And um, so we put her back. We started to put her back in bed. The nurses did. I didn't. And she looked at them, and she went, ah! And she put her hands up around her head like this. There was something in the back of her head here, in her brain, that told her, I just got a haircut. My hair just got fixed. You can't mess my hair up. And she was just, uh, and she's trying to protect her hair. And they started laughing. They said, she realizes that you cut her hair. And I said, well, I didn't know that she would know that. But I said, I'm glad that she does because she always, like I said, wanted to be so pretty. And um, so she went back to bed and, and uh, then the tubes went in for good and they didn't come back out. Then it went on and on, and it got to where there was nothing but just um, infection and pus coming from her kidneys into her urine bag. And um, I would stay there from the time I came from school till 9, 10, 11 o'clock that night, and then I would go home. And then I, my other two sisters were with me, but the one sister, she, she always was a coward. She, she was a coward. She was afraid of everything. And mommy's sick or daddy's sick. She couldn't take it. But uh, my one sister that was had been really strong so far for me, she said, I can't handle it anymore, Joan. She said, I'm not going to be able to come back. She said, I can't. I just can't do it. She said, I can't go through it. And I said, well, I said, if you can't do it, I said, I'll stay. So um, they started calling me at night, and they said, well, we're not expecting her to live through the night, so I'd go down. She was still, I, I was holding her hand. And I would always sing songs to her. And I was, she was at the place now that Jesus loves me, this I know, was the song that I sang to her all the time. And... Um, it seemed to ease her down a little bit, and she would hear my voice, and she would turn so expectantly, like, oh, and then she'd look at me, and she'd go, oh, that wasn't who she was. She was expecting on seeing me the way I used to look when she was much, much younger, and uh, uh, she was expecting me to see, see me much younger, but because she recognized the voice, but she didn't recognize the face. And she would just get so torn up when she wouldn't recognize the face. And um, that hurt me so much because I was hoping I could just say, Mommy, it's me. It's me. You're okay. You're okay. Daddy is waiting for you. And I would tell her that. I would say, Daddy is waiting for you, and Jesus is waiting for you, honey. And they're just waiting to welcome you home. And um, um, she would be listening and listening for that. And one day, my brother-in-law was a minister. And she looked over on the wall and she said, uh, Look at Ronald preach. This was before the tubes went in. Look at Ronald preach. And she took her hand and she was waving it like this because that's what she would do when she's in church. And she said, oh, he is preaching so well. 
And Jen called me that night and she said, Ronald has been in the hospital, said he had a temperature of 105 today. They had him packed in ice. So when Mommy was seeing Ronald preach, that's when he was packed in ice with a 105 degree temperature. And I guess their minds connected. I don't know, but he must have been preaching a powerful sermon. And uh, I said, I told her what Mommy had done. She said, oh my goodness. She said, you never know what's going on in something like that. I said, no, you don't. So uh, Mommy just kept getting uh, worse, and uh, I, would, I would say, um, Mommy, uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Daddy's waiting for you. Daddy is waiting, and Jesus is waiting for you too. And Daddy and Jesus are together. And uh, so the nurses, like I said, they called me about probably five times saying that she wasn't expected to live any time for me to get there as soon as I could. And my other sister that I told you that had been the little coward, she had gotten to where she could get up the nerve to stand at the door and just look in. She couldn't come in the room, but she would look in the door. And that was a lot of support for me because I was alone. And that was a lot of support for me. And um, she would say, Joan, are you all right? I say, I'm okay. And I was still singing to Mommy, still singing. And uh, so then um, they called me one time. And uh, when I went in, they said, we don't think she'll make it through the night. I said, okay. So I stayed. I stayed three days and three nights. And my sister stayed with me. And uh, one of the nights, I said, uh, her name was Ruby, and I called her Reuben. I said, Reuben, I said, I've got to get just a little bit of sleep. I said, I'm going to just lie down on the couch just a minute and get just a little bit of sleep. I said, if you need me, though, come and get me. So uh, she said, okay. She said, you need to sleep. You need to sleep. You haven't had any sleep for three days. And I said, I'll be fine. So I walked, I went in, walked in there, and I just um, sat down on the couch, and I just leaned over, and um, I probably had been there about half an hour, 45 minutes. Here she comes, and she says, Joan said she's getting really bad, and um, so I jumped up, and I took back in there, and the nurse told me, she said, honey, she said, um, her blood pressure is beginning to go down, really. Now, she said, I, we're not looking for it to come back up. She said, it's going down, and it's going fast. And she said, she's not going to be here long. And I was still holding her hand, because I always held her hand. And she looked at me, and she said, I'm going to tell you something. And she said, I know that it's not what you're going to want to hear. She said, but I'm telling you for your mother's good and for your good. She said, as long as you hold her hand, she's going to fight to stay here with you. She said, but if you let her hand go, she said she will go ahead and leave. And I looked at her like, you are wanting me to turn loose of my mama's hand? I thought, I can't do that. And then I looked down and I saw her line that went from her to her um, thing on her bed. And it was nothing but pus. And I said, I'm being too selfish. I am totally too selfish. I have no right to keep her here. And her expands as much pain as she is in. And I looked at her and I told her, I said, Mommy, I said, I'm going to let your hand lay down right here. But I'm standing right here. And I said, Daddy is waiting for you. And Jesus is waiting for you. And I said, so... 
Don't you feel bad. You go with Daddy and with Jesus. Don't you worry about us. We will be fine. And I said, I love you. And she looked up at me. And for the first time in probably seven months or eight months, she looked at me and her eyes were clear. She could see me. She knew who I was. And she looked at me. She couldn't say a thing, but she looked at me. And when she looked at me, there was so much love in her eyes that you will never know how much love was in those eyes. And she was just the same as saying, Joni, I love you, sweetheart, so much. And I said, I would have gone through that whole thing just to have seen those eyes looking at me and saying, I love you, and recognizing me. And I said, there was a tear came out of this eye, and it started rolling down across her nose. And I said, Mommy, I love you with all my heart, and I will see you in heaven with Daddy and Jesus. And she took one deep breath, and that was it. She closed her eyes, and she was gone. And I had never questioned Jesus before or God before because my faith was just right there. But I thought, she has been, I, I've been doing this for a few months. I thought she has been such a good woman. All of her life, she's never caused anyone any problems, any harm. She's never done anything. She's been a mother, an exemplary mother wife, a family member, everything. And I said, I thought, why is she being kept here to suffer like this? And I had never questioned God about anything because I always thought he knew best. And I just couldn't put wrap my brain around why is she being kept here and to suffer. There's no use for it. Well, I've always heard that when someone passes away, they can see what's going on in the room for about 15 minutes. And I'm one, I'm going to cover all my bases. So I stood there with her for 15 minutes, and then I was ready to collapse. I just walked over and sat down in a big chair that was sitting there right beside her bed, but I could see her right there. I just sat down. And I just put my head over. And about that time, the nurse walks in. And she said, honey, she says, I know that you're exhausted. She said, but I want you to know that you had a mother that was one that you could be very proud of. And I said, I know that. I said, I know that quite well. I said, uh, my mother and my father both were like that. And I said, that's why I hate to give them up. And um, she said, there was just one thing that I always, I wondered, uh, and I started to talk to you about it one time. She said, but I knew you were so busy. I studying and everything when you were here. And then when uh, she would be, uh, you know, needing attention, you were giving her attention. And she said, I wouldn't bother you with it. But she said, I always kept wondering where she was getting those tracks that were in her purse. And I looked at her and I said, uh, tracks? She said, yes, that she gave those out. So many she gave out to our patients here on this floor. And she said she would go from room to room when she was up walking. And said she would tell them about God and about Jesus, and she would give them a track. And I don't know if you all know what a track is. Some of you may not be religious. A track is just a little card that is folded, and uh, it has a little verse about the Bible or something in there about it. 
And I said, where did she get the tracks? And she said, I assumed that you put them in her purse, that she kept getting them out of her purse because they always were in her purse. And I said, no. I said, she had no, she had nothing in her purse. I said, I didn't put anything at all in her purse. And she looked at me and she said, that's kind of funny. She said, because she always, when she would use one stack of them, they would always be replaced. And I looked at her and I thought, thank you, God. Thank you for easing my mind and telling me why my mother had to go through this. My mother's role had not been finished on earth yet. She had been a Christian all of her life and God was not through using her yet. There were people in that nursing home who were mean, the patients. And she had been up giving these patients tracks about God and talking to them about God. And he had allowed her to do that, to continue her ministry of speaking, because she, she never met a stranger, and she always talked to everyone all of her life about God and what God did for us and everything. And I thought, that's why my mother had to stay here. She, her work wasn't finished. And when it was finished, he took her home. So that relieved my, and I, I just said, thank you, God. And I told some of the kids about it. I said, God was still using mommy when she was in the nursing home to save souls, help save souls of people who were non-Christians. And you wouldn't think of a nursing home to be a place for one of the patients to be because one of the patients that was at the foot of her bed, she talked to her an awful lot. And her daughter was telling me what a marvelous woman mommy was. And uh, when she was folding the clothes and trying to dust the things for the people, I guess she was giving them tracks at that, that time. Now, there was no one bringing tracks in because Mommy had no visitors. I knew all the visitors. None of my family was bringing tracks in. They were being supplied as she needed them in her purse. Now, anyone can tell that story, and you might not believe it, but I've got some stories like that that I can tell you, just like the writing on the wall when my husband, about six weeks before he died, the white finger just writing across the wall, all across the wall, and it said, it's not your time to go just yet, but soon comes in to talk to me about it. And he says, what do you think that meant? He said, you'll never see the white that I just saw. And he said, it was just like a finger. Took that a finger and started writing in beautiful cursive writing. And he said, the white was so brilliant. He said, I've never seen white like that on this earth. He said, you'll never see white like that. And I said, he said, what do you think that meant? And I told this once, this little bit once before. But in case you didn't see it, I said, well, I said, it, he, it said not just now. And he said, that's what I thought. I said, well, at least it lets you know that you have a while yet. He said, that's what I thought. And he was satisfied with that answer. But he saw the writing on the wall, in his bedroom wall, and he said, I had been awake for hours and hours. He said, I wasn't asleep. He said, I wasn't groggy. He said, I'm, and he sat there talking to me just like I'm talking with you. He saw the writing on the wall. And Mommy had tracks in her, in her purse.
that had nothing in it because I deliberately made sure there was nothing in her purse because I didn't think she would ever look in it. But she did, and she found tracks in there. And I, I didn't think about tracks. I didn't think about putting her tracks in there because she was so bad she didn't know me. But yet she was down there trying to give them to patients until she got so bad they had to put a tube down her throat and put her in bed. So that's just some of the things that I can tell you about. That's just one of the things that blows your mind when you think about it. And um, I have, the reason I haven't been back to talk with you all about that is I knew that that is one that God wanted me to tell. And I'm going to do anything that I can that God wants me to do. Because I think the days we are living in now, we are living in a time that if we don't speak up, we may not have that much longer to speak up. And I want people to know what side I'm on. I am on God's side. And He is my pilot. And He is my Savior. And Jesus is the one that bled and died for me. And he didn't want to die. No one does. But he did it anyway. For us. For me. For my children. For you. For your children. For your grandchildren. For my grandchild. And it's... It's um, something that we're going to have to do. And I have gone told this much longer than I should have but it's what happened it's the way it happened and um, I just felt I haven't been able to get on here to talk about it I started to do it the other day and my blood pressure went up so high I couldn't do it I had to just keep taking blood pressure pills and forget about it and this morning I thought it was 3 o'clock in the morning and I thought, I'm going to get up, I'm going to put my makeup on, I'm going to tell what Mommy was doing, and what a tremendous mother and father I had, and how much of an influence they had on me. And I have tried to pass that influence on to my family. And um, I think that my two children are exceptional children. And my little granddaughter, she's an exceptional young lady. And that's what she is. She's a young lady. And I'm extremely proud of her. And um, I'm going to let you go now. And um, I hope that you will be able to take something from the pain that mommy went through, that she suffered, and what daddy went through, and what we children have been through since we lost them, because, but we will see them again, because they are in heaven and we know that. And every one of my family members are gone now but me. I'm the last one. And I had a birthday last month. I was 79 years old. So I don't have that many years to live. Uh, I may have 20 years, who knows. But when you start getting up to 79, you start thinking, um, it's about time I started talking about what God has done for me and doing some things for Him. And um, so that's why uh, I've always tried to be a Christian. I have always tried to be a Christian. And um, we have our problems. Like when I was, the first time in my life, I was beginning to doubt why God was doing what he did. But he showed me right away that it wasn't in vain. 
it, there's hard to tell how many souls were saved because Mommy showed them the, the uh, tracks and explained to them about God and, and talked with them in only the way that she could. She was down to earth. She, she just talked to you just in a manner that, um, not pushy, but just loving. She had a very loving personality. And um, I hope that she did a lot of good because she suffered a lot while she was going through it. And um, I don't blame God for that now. I, I, it's over, and I knew the minute I heard she had the tracks in her purse, I thought, that's why you were keeping her here, God. Forgive me for, for, for doubting why you were doing it. Because I knew there had to be a reason, but I didn't know what. And then it was so strange that the nurse just walked straight up to me the minute that she passed away, just about. I probably sat there maybe 10 minutes after I sat down in the chair. And then she walked over. I just can't get over how she passed those tracks out all the time. And it's the first I'd ever heard of it. And she'd been in there probably seven months. And uh, it was very rewarding and um but um i'm gonna let you guys go i've kept you way too long and um, any of my ramblings i'll try to uh, make a little <laughs> shorter and um hope that you are all doing beautifully and you're getting along well and um if you know God, thank you. God thanks you. He loves you. And uh, if you don't, you might want to see uh, what you could learn if you would get a Bible and start reading it. You might find out that you could learn a lot of things. So I will talk with you guys later. And uh, I love all of you. Don't forget that. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.